All right, this is going to be a response to a uh, Reddit comment, actually. I don't typically use Reddit for political debates. Uh, my videos get posted there every once in a while, and I'll go and look at the comments that happen in those, but otherwise I don't use Reddit for politics. And someone had made a series of uh, pro-democracy comments uh, in a video of mine that I had commented on. I had posted that basically... Uh, a quib that, you know, I, I can exercise whatever tyranny over you as long as a group of my friends say that we have voted to do so, and a Reddit user going by the name of only creating, only creating to upvote, which I will link to the comments uh, that I'm describing in the description. It's fairly brief, so it's not something that you'd have to spend hours and hours reading. Uh, he said that that was a sarcastic comment and not a realistic one, that democracy really is a check on rulership and that the, the people actually get to decide, quote-unquote. Um, and, you know, he says at one point, um, I, well, I describe his view as considerable unreality. He says, you know, people have an influence, and I say that's ridiculous. Uh, at the minimum, the process of voting and the ability to recall electors, electorates keeps the decision ultimately with the people. You also seem to be omitting that a voter can as well be candidate, be a candidate for office. Well, let's realistically look at being a candidate for office. Let's say... Uh, because I, you know, I use the analogy, I'm just going to go to my neighbors and I'm going to say, look, I, I have a group of my friends and I have voted and we get to rule over you. You have to pay us property taxes. We have to get regulated by this. And he said, this is ridiculous. They can control it. You know, you can always run for office, but let's think about that. If you want to run for office, you know, you come to, you come to me and you say this, and this isn't in our hypothetical situation. This is the way it is right now. You know, um, government comes to you and says you have to do this or that you have to go to jail because you smoke marijuana or, or any something something else something else you don't like you don't agree with and you say I, I don't agree with this so I'm gonna run for office and then I say well look fine you can run for office but I declare that we only can run for office every couple years so in two years you can run for office in the meantime I can tax and regulate you as much as I see fit and you're obligated to obey uh, second uh, I can also decide whether or not you even get to vote or whether you even get to run for office. I can say you're an immigrant. I can say you violated some law, and then you don't get to run. And it's not up to you. You don't get to appeal. I just get to declare. You can appeal to the courts, I suppose, but I appoint the courts and I pay for the courts. And I part the courts and I the courts are my buddies, uh, who I've either appointed or who are in the same political party as me and who got elected on the same platform as I did. And then uh, you can come and say, well. I'm gonna, I'm gonna run as uh, you know the party that's gonna end marijuana illegalization, or, I, or who's gonna uh, you know make everything right. And I say, you know what, uh, your party it, it's not big enough, so it doesn't even get to be on the ballot. Uh, so uh, as much as you want to run, you can't run because I don't think that uh, you're legitimate to run against me. And then you say that's not fair. I want to run. I believe in democracy. And I'm like, all right, I'll make a deal. You can run if you get so many signatures and raise so much money and go through all this legal, uh, you know, jump through all these legal hoops that I set. And if you trip on any of them, I'll just deny it. You know, if you can get thousands and thousands of signatures, and I'll say that one or two of them are wrong, that they're people who I deem unworthy to be voters, and then I'll throw out the entire petition. Uh, or you'll get your petition passed, and it will be voted on. And of course, I'll pick when the election happens, and I'll pick who counts the votes. I'll ki I'll pick how the actual voting takes place. You know, whether it be by ballot or electronic. I'll decide where the places are to vote. I'll decide who can vote. But let's assume that you know you get your thing passed. My judges can just as easily say it's not constitutional and just say they're not going to pass it, which is what happened to say Prop Eight in California. It's happened other times as well. I knew municipalities where people have passed issues to ban the use of uh, like uh, red light cameras only to have the government just say well we have contracts so we have to do it doesn't matter what the people think they can just throw it out this isn't hypothetical in my make-believe scenario this is the actual scenario so uh, I'll deny you ba ballot access if you're gonna run yourself if you're just gonna run or, or form your own party or your own make everything better 
uh, I'm just going to say you don't have access, you don't get airtime, you don't get to be on the ballots unless you jump through all these hoops uh, that I can set and I can change the conditions for which at any point that I want. Uh, if you you know, if you want to come to a debate, I'll just throw you in prison, which is what happens when third party candidates attempt to go to debates. You know, the last debates where we had third parties was when the debates were being put on by the League of Women's Voters, which, although it's certainly a political organization, is not part of the government. And that was when Ross Perot and his vice presidential candidate got to take part in the debates. And as soon as that happened, in the aftermath, the two political parties decided they didn't like having competition like that, and so they took away the presidential debate from the League of Women Voters, and they control it totally themselves. Now, in 2004, uh, the Libertarian Party made a big stink because they hosted it in Arizona. Arizona has a decent-sized Libertarian population. I believe they had something like 17, 18,000 registered voters in Arizona who were Libertarians, members of the Libertarian Party who paid taxes to support a presidential debate and their candidate Michael Bednarik figured well then I should be able to be in this presidential debate and he got arrested along with the Green Party candidate attempting to go there so that's yeah you can take part in the political process but I can arrest you if you even try so the only way you can really run is by joining one of the main parties but that entails its own degree of collusion because in the parties there's a caucus and a, and a, a primary process where the party gets to pick who runs. It's not the people, it's not some democratic vote of everybody, it's only the people who are members of the party who get to decide. And the people who are in the party are heavily dependent on the political elites within these parties. If the incumbent president is in your party, he's the head of the party and he's going to get the nomination. There's, I don't think, ever been a case where that wasn't what happened, although there have been times when people thought about challenging it. Uh, there is definitely a party hierarchy uh, and you don't get to get the nomination because you have some stellar issue that you really care about. It's because you are partisan and because you are a party hack and you put the the interests of the party and the interests of the party a lot since the po the power of the party comes from the government. You know the po the power of the DNC is by by virtue by virtue of their influence on the government and the power of the GOP comes from virtue of their power over the government and so they have a, a convergence of incentives of interest and that is the power of government so serious candidates who want to limit the power of government don't get very far they're the gadflies they get to come to some of the primaries and some of the debates and they don't get to win that's where the Dennis Kucinich's and the Ron Paul's and you know the the the, the Howard Dean's even as much as I might disagree with people like that they you know believe in civil liberties and maybe they're not pro-war enough and so they don't make it. So the idea that uh, <laughs> that you can just run for office and, and change things is completely ridiculous. You know, again, that's how the process is right now in our democracy. If we want to take it back to the analogy of me and my buddies, all I'll say is, look, uh, sure, uh, you can run against me uh, to, to, to change the system, but again, I'm going to tell you when you can run in the meantime, I get to tax and regulate you as much as I want. I can disqualify you or any p potential voter uh, from voting. I can gerrymander as much as I want. I can simply say, oh, you want to run? Well, the electorate is going to be composed of you and then all of my friends. And they'll be the electorate and we'll vote and it will be all my friends versus you. And then you'll lose the election. And that's totally legitimate. That happens all the time. There's a word for that. It's called gerrymandering. And it's just part of the business. If you don't think that that's what's going on, then you're hopelessly naive. Um, again, in the meantime, you know, I'll be taxing and regulating you as much as I see fit. If you want to try and get on the ballot, that's going to take a lot of money. You know, to get enough signatures, to go through the legal process, to get your name on the ballot, it's like a huge expensive thing. Now, maybe you want to go through all that trouble, but it's rather unlikely and it's going to be hard since I'm going to be taking a third of your income and then taxing half of the rest away or close to that when you aggregate it all together and through arbitrary regulations that can literally prohibit you from even doing that so even if you were to find say a rich person who wanted to help you I'll say well he can only give you two thousand uh, dollars or twenty four hundred dollars or whatever it is uh, and uh, you know I'll set all the rules so it's it's completely ridiculous you know I can set I can set the rules of the game any way I want 
you have to play by them. I get to be the referee of whether you're playing by those rules. I can veto uh, or abolish anything you do at any point. I can just say, have some judge who works for me, literally, say that what you did was wrong and you're not, you don't get to, I can disqualify you from voting. And then, you know, what's so outrageous about all this is what's the, what's the basis for it has to be my rules? Why can't you say, well, no, the election process is going to be my friends and my rules. Why do you have to go through all the hoops I put forward first? There's an assumption here. You know, the, the problem with the democratic justification for the coercive rights of the state is that it is based on the presupp presupposition that the state already has the right to do those things. You know, there, the, 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 why, why, you know, if it's just that, well, the state allows some kind of franchise, then you can say, look, I'm going to be my own state, and I'm going to have my own kind of franchise. Why do you have to be subservient to the other person who says that you have to be part of their franchise? What's the justification? The other thing is the complete um, misunderstanding of where our government even gets its power. You know, our government did not form, and this is true with any government, because everyone in a society got together and said, we need to have a government... Oh, let's see who's on the phone. No, nobody. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, the United States wasn't formed because everybody in the society got together and said, let's have a democracy and let's all vote. Even if they had, it would be hard to see how that would then follow through hundreds of years uh, to now we're still obligated because our great, 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 great grandfathers decided to form a democracy. But that's not what happened at all. How the United States started was that the closest thing to absolute monarchs that ever existed in the history of England the Stuarts, uh, most especially Charles, James I, Charles I, Charles II, and James II, looked at a map and they said, all the area between this parallel and that parallel belongs to me. Not because, you know, like the Marxists have an idea of property rights based on usage. So like if you're using something, and I think that's a very problematic basis for property rights, but it's not that. You know, they didn't, they, that's not the basis. There's, of course, the Lockean mixed with your labor, original appropriation, homesteading principle. No, it wasn't that. They did, the Stuart Kings didn't go and homestead North America or Australia. Uh, they just said, we own all of it. Regardless of what they have done or who already lived there and or had property rights and the Native Americans had very diverse cultures and they had different ideas about property and who owned what. Uh, by most conceptions of property I have, even Western ones, Native Americans had rights to at least some of the land. Or you could look at a place like Australia, where they just look at the entire continent and say it's terrace nullis. Nobody owns it, and so the Queen owns all of it. They just completely arbitrarily claim ownership over an entire continent. And then, what does the King do? Is he starts saying, okay, I want to make money off of this. The king doesn't look at it and be like, this is an opportunity for my people to better themselves. You know, and I can, they can go and prosper and then I can extend the umbrella of my order, cre order creating beneficence over them and the world will be great. The king looks at it the way all government officials look at, how can I gain from this? And the only way he sees he can gain from it is to allow people to go there and to do productive things and then to tax them for it. And so what did the kings of England do? What did James I do? Is he granted uh, titles. He granted dispensations where he would say, you, uh, the Virginia Company, for instance, uh, you have a right to all the land, and he'd parcel out. He wouldn't give them everything he was going to claim, which they claimed everything from Georgia all the way up to Maine, uh, the entire east coast of the United States, uh, Florida with the Spanish had already done the same thing, Canada, the French had already done the same thing, so the English satisfied themselves with everything else. Uh, although, you know, there was overlap and, you know, we had a couple wars. But he says, okay, I'll give you, Virginia Company, this area. And then you can go and you will own it. 
outright the Virginia company and then you will pay me you know 10 20 percent of all the gold and silver you produce which wasn't very much but then you have to pay taxes on all your shipping and you'll have to pay quick quick rents what is a quick rent a quick rent is you're a serf but instead of being tied to the land you just pay me a percentage of your income it's basically mercantilist serfdom you go and you say look I own you I own your labor I own the land but I'm not gonna force you to work on just this land because I realize the most I can expect is just a tiny surplus of grain but if I let you go into the town and work you'll make some wages and just give me part of those and we'll call it good it's basically an income tax but they call them quick rents so he'll give he'll give some to the Virginia company or the Massachusetts Bay Company, or the Plymouth Company, or he'll give it to an individual person, say the Lord of Baltimore, that's what Maryland came from, he goes, ah, you're a good feudal lord, I'll just grant you millions of acres, you can have that, and then you just, you'll get to be a feudal lord there, everyone who, who lives there will be your subject, you can charge quick, rent, quick rents to them, then pay quick rents to me, and the whole point is that this is a whole area that can generate revenue for the crown. That's the whole reason, and it's also completely arbitrary. The king simply says, I own this land, and I am taking it. And any Indians who object, they get slaughtered. And any Europeans who go and settle their own area and say, this is my area, I own this area, I'm the one who created the wealth here, it's not an arbitrary claim, I have come and built my farmstead or my house or my town, and this did happen, it happened in Albemarle in North Carolina, it happened in Rhode Island, it happened everywhere on the frontier, where people actually go out and actually create something, and then the armed forces of the crown, via their royal governor proxies, whether they be Governor Berkeley in Virginia, or Governor Andros in New York, or which was before that the same thing, but for the Netherlands, uh, or uh, well, eventually Andros became the governor general of all of New England. Uh, they come and they say, "We're going to oppress you." unless you submit and bend the knee. Complete coercion. Or they go to the Indians and they just kill them all. On purpose. I mean, there's one thing when they get diseases, that's ended up being the, the worst killer, and that's not necessarily the Europeans' volitional fault. They didn't choose to do that, although it happened. It was their fault in the sense that because they were there, it happened. Um, but then they would just say, we're going and we're going to kill all of you and steal your land. That's the basis of the, of the United States government. You know, and the legislature's role in this is is quite minimal. You know, the 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 way it had developed in England was the king has absolute rule to put a check against his power. They said, okay, but you have to get some kind of consent, and so you develop a parliament, and the parliament gets to basically say, if you need more money, you have to ask them. But you know, it's interesting because the governments, the elected legislatures in these colonies, uh, they were only a very thin minority of the population. Obviously only men, and typically only men with a certain amount of property, and that certain amount was either middle class or upper middle class, or only the very wealthy, and it even went further than that in Massachusetts Bay. The only people who could be vote would be the people who their state appointed minister said was okay, and so they could say, okay, if you're a Quaker, you can't vote. If you're an Anglican, you can't vote. If you're a Catholic, you can't vote. Actually, for some of those groups, that you would have been put to death for talking about the right decade. Um, and if you don't like the government very much, you don't get to vote. Um, and they can determine the franchise any way they see, which means they can perpetuate any kind of oligarchy that they want, which is exactly what happened. This is in in in, in New England and in, in Massachusetts Bay. It was a puritanical oligarchy. Uh, in Virginia, it was a planter oligarchy. You know, there became this big division in Virginia eventually where you have all these people who weren't planters, but they were disenfranchised. They didn't have any political power because the oligarchy in charge that's running the government for their interest, not for the some Benthamite notion of what's best for everybody. They're running it for their own benefit, and they get to decide who the electorate is. And it's always a tiny mi minority. It's never the majority. Even today, I think... Uh, Obama received, what, 68 million votes the last time he got elected? That's out of a population of over 300 million. So that's the basis for his rulership. It's completely ridiculous to characterize this as it's an open system where anyone who wants to can just come in and take, take part. It's fixed. 
And the question is, why do they have the right? Why does one person have the right to fix it, whereas another person doesn't? Why, why is it that, um, in my scenario, I would be the one who gets to decide who gets to run, what the boundaries are, what the election process is, what the taxes are, what the regulations are. You have to jump through all those hoops. And if you manage to do it, and I consent at every step of the way, then you can take part in the government. Why is the onus on you? Why isn't it on me? What What's the magic um, genesis of the political authority that I have to rule over you? Uh, and it's obvious uh, that it's a rigged game, that one that you can't win at, or the only way you can succeed at is be, by being my acolyte, of being someone who's a sycophant to me, someone who's obedient and willing to be pliable to my, my, my desire. And that's who gets put ahead, all right? That's why Barack Obama is not some radical egalitarian who's going to help the middleman. That's why he's a crony capitalist warmonger, because that's the only reason he gets as far as he did. If he was out there all pie in the sky, some some notion of what's best for everybody and not the best for some political elite, then we would never have heard of him. He never would have made it past community organizer. You probably wouldn't even have made it to college. And it's not just Obama, it's a both parties are like that. You know, the, the, the Ron Pauls and Justin Amashes of the GOP, they're on the fringes and they always will be because they don't advance the interests of the government. You know, the the king, the king did not create colonies in North America because they would hurt his interests, because they would be bad for him. He did it because he thought that they would be good for him. And he arbitrarily just gave in. First it was James I, then his son Charles I. Uh, you know, like, um, when Charles II came back to the throne, obviously they had a revolution in England and there was a restoration. Uh, when Charles II came back, uh, he gave New York to his brother, James II. Do you really think there was any kind of, hmm, the best thing that could possibly happen with this new territory that we conquered from the Dutch, that we stole from the Dutch, uh, who arguably maybe didn't steal it from the Indians because they tended to pay for it and have good relations with the Indians most of the time, uh, but definitely the English stole it from the Dutch. Uh, do you think there's any argument that can be made that the best thing would be to convert New York into a feudal, a fiefdom, of James the second you know like is there any kind of argument that could be made that that's the best solution that they're about you know the, the James Charles of second was sitting there thinking you know what would be the best thing for the poor people of New York City I know they're deprived from the overlordship of my younger brother obviously not obviously the whole point of that exercise and of all of them was to aggrandize in that case the monarch and now the genius of democracy is that people think, oh, well, now they're not aggrandizing anybody. There's no special interest. Government workers, uh, gov politicians are, are somehow altruistic. They, do, they, don't, they don't think in terms of what's best for them in some sense, but they all only think about what's best for some notion of everybody. That's, of course, why they have, you know, uh, tack, they, ta they will put tariffs on sugar because it's best for everybody that a couple planters and Florida and Louisiana become millionaires. It's best for everybody that Lockheed Martin make you know 25% profit all the time no matter what. It's best for everybody that we invade Iraq and Afghanistan. It's best for everybody that the NSA spy on all people all the time and record all digital uh, data all the time. That, that, that's completely altruism. That has nothing to do with what's best for the government. Just like when, when Charles II gave his younger brother the state of New York, that was because that's what's best for the people in New York and not because it's what's best for the Stuart family, right? You know, like the the ability for people to, to, to identify the, uh, the nepotism and the favoritism and the self-interest in a monarch, but not to identify it in an elected politician and an unelected entrenched bureaucracy is amazing. It's what it's the one thing democracy has going for it. Uh, you know, the idea that you can recall, oh yeah, you can unelect politicians. How many politicians get unelected, huh? How many of them get impeached? Nixon would have, except he resigned, and Clinton got impeached for bullshit. Uh, of all the things he could have been impeached for, that uh, they never get charged with crimes. You know, I had another conversation on on Reddit some months ago, and someone was like, look. I don't see what you keep saying Obama's a criminal. Obama's not a criminal. The Justice Department has never charged him with anything.
Well, uh, do you think, honestly, that the Justice Department that is run by Eric Holder, who has been uh, a political ally and underling of Obama for, what, two decades now at least, that who owes his entire position and his salary, his fame, and his power to Barack Obama is an objective prosecutor of potential crimes of himself and of his boss? Is that the literal view of someone who says, well, the Justice Department you know, hasn't hasn't charged Obama with anything. Well, of course it hasn't. That isn't. A, but but for someone to think that that is a good indication of their innocence is naive in the extreme. Uh, now then he well that and that's a separate person. So I'm not going to claim that uh, only creating to upvote says that. Although it would not surprise me if that's uh, something that he believes in also. Uh, you know the 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 notion that you know we can just uh, well he says well people just don't have the zeal you know the problem with democracy isn't democracy it's just that people don't have enough zeal why should they have zeal you or I can spend all day every day researching the relevant issues the t the, the politicians their character their voting records. Uh, their speeches, their rhetoric, their policies. We can look into history. We can look into economics. We can look into everything. We can spend all day, every day. And then we're going to go vote. And then they may or may not counter vote. Um, there's a, oh, And then some other person who just like, I like the, his speech. Uh, he has the right letter in front of him. They're going to vote too. And their vote counts the same as yours or mine. And the thing is, 68 million people, 100 million people vote in a national election, more than that, 140, 150 million. Uh, or it's not, it's really the Electoral College, so say you live in a state. And most most of the people live in a state where there are millions and millions of people, and there's probably over a million votes. So let's just be really, really generous and say you have a one in a million chance of affecting the, uh, the election in your state, which is false you don't have a one in a million chance because even if it gets close to within a couple hundred then you don't decide then the government gets to decide the government will have a recount or they'll have the supreme court just declare which happened in 2000 i guess people don't have a long enough memory to realize that it doesn't come down to one vote ever if it ever gets close then they simply recount and even assuming that there's no um, you know fraud going on in those situations they're certainly not leaving it up to the one vote. It's going to go to the Supreme Court or the Attorney General, uh, the State Attorney General, whoever, who's also going to be a party member. Uh, fancy that. But you're, even if they assume, if, even if you assume that they you know, sincerely count them and they only care about the will of the people and blah, 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 you're, all that effort that you went through doesn't count any more than the person who doesn't give a damn, who, who's an ignorant moron who doesn't know anything about politics doesn't know and i could just ask you what's the last thing that obama signed what's the last thing that he vetoed you don't know you know you can look on google and then you're going to come back and say oh i knew now did you know that before i asked no are you going to know that when you go vote no and yet you know you can tell which one's the best one there there is a huge disincentive for taking hours and hours out of every day to make an informed decision when your informed decision doesn't count any more than the completely uninformed decision that took no more effort than what makes you feel good when you go into the ballot box. And that's how most people vote. Oh, that yeah, feels good. They don't pay the cost. You know, the, the negative effects of their voting get spread over everybody, and so they don't pay. You know, if you buy the wrong car yourself, then you suffer the consequences from that. You get stuck with a lemon, or you get stuck with a car that doesn't meet your needs, or you buy bad food then yeah, then you pay the cost of that. And so there's more disincentive and also more incentive to make the right choice. Not so in politics. Even if we had direct democracy, but we don't. We have representative democracy, which is just elected oligarchy. Uh, you know, it, it, to, to believe, if, if you think that, well, it would work, if everybody was super, you know, paying really close attention all the time and scrutinizing, but it doesn't happen that way. What what democracy ever existed that met that criteria? None. You know, who's, and this is, goes back to my, my comment about unreality. What reality are you talking about where all the voters are super well informed? You know, they don't have any kind of knowledge problems. Funny, like, oh yeah, capitalism doesn't work because you don't know what's necessarily going to be in the food. But, 
you can well you know it's in the heart of politicians and you understand all the um, intricacies of the uh, with the fall within the scope of government and the scope of government basically is everything at this point um, that you can decide rationally between and, and objectively and logically between various alternatives the, the two really because the other ones are disallowed from any meaningful participation and you think that's like an unreasonable statement do you are, are you really gonna sit there and tell me yeah that third and fourth and fifth parties you know have have the same fair shake as, as everybody else like no I don't know. Like that, if you believe that, then you are far more naive than you've let on so far. Uh, removing politicians, yeah, because that's so easy. And then he says, well, that is my position. If the state you speak of owns the land, then I have given them the right to rule me. How? how, how I don't understand. So, James, the reason that the government owns the land is because the government says it owns the land. You know, James I just says, I own I own North America, or or Queen Elizabeth, uh, or who was it, it would have been the Hanoverians. You know, they say, I own all of Australia, I just own it. It doesn't matter who already lives there, what other, other property rights may exist or may not exist, I own it all. That's their simple assertion. So this is no different than my analogy of me coming up to you and say, I own your house, I own this whole neighborhood. It's completely arbitrary. And if it's not arbitrary, please explain what the non-arbitrary nature of it is. You know, and then I say, and if you try and leave, I'm going to take half your wealth. I'm going to tax and regulate you. Uh, I'm going to throw you in prison if you don't pay me. And then people don't rise up in rebellion. Hence, they have agreed to me. You know, like, like the, the idea that by not, this is so, this is such, the, the consent can be given by simply not fleeing is the lowest uh, determinant of consent imaginable. You know, I can come to anybody and say, if you don't, if you don't leave in five minutes, then you're my slave. You know, and they don't leave, and so oh, they're my slave. If you don't vacate your house, uh, then I own it and you. And if you're still there in the morning, I'm going to start taxing you. If you try and resist, I will. I will have my my buddies come beat the shit out of you and throw you in prison. Oh yeah, that means they consent. That means they do own everything because they say so. You know, how is my arbitrary? How is my declaration of ownership any less arbitrary than James the first's answer me that and then you know and, and this is kind of the the acid test you know when the American colonies decided and I don't want to say that collectively but when the elected legislatures that were again only elected by a minority because most people didn't have the franchise when they said they wanted to leave England did the English crown say well democracy matters and uh, you know that's the will of the people there and so we allow you to leave no no they launched a horrible war to try and prevent that from happening oh that's the crown and that's different well what happened when the american south did the same thing they didn't have a king and they got together and they said we want to leave and did the federal government say well we respect democracy no they said we don't respect democracy we are going to rule you no matter what and then you can say well that's not fair because they didn't get consent of all the people who live you know, the, the northern states didn't also agree with the South. Well, that comes back to the whole who gets to decide who gets to vote. Yeah, I can say you can vote, but you have to vote, just you, and then all my friends get to vote. And then you lose the election, and then you have to be my slave for as long as that situation maintains itself. And if you try and leave, then you're a rebel and you should be destroyed. You know, root cotton tree, to take a quote from a movie. Uh... Does that does that like make any is is that any kind of justification whatsoever? Why can't I then just go to you and just say, hey, you have to do whatever I say, and uh, I decide who gets to vote and whether you get to leave or not. And if you just you know you and your buddies get together and say, well, we're we're forming our own democracy and you know we don't need your electorate. No, you have no you have no recourse for doing that. Blah blah blah. Let me see. Of course, then he says, the issue really is that you have an ill-formed definition of the state. You speak of the state as some entity that exists in reality. Uh, if it doesn't exist in reality, how does it own? And then he goes, own anything. In all reality, the only thing that the state defines is a society. The American society owns the land we call America is so much as we're willing to fight anyone else who claims ownership. We're, you've just 
said, I have a bad definition of the state, which I never gave a definition of the state, so how does he know I have an ill-defined one? And then he says state and society are synonyms. They're the same thing. So uh, the fact that you are unable to distinguish the state from the rest of society speaks more to your ability to define or not define a state than anything that I've said or not said. Uh, and then he says, your argument is just a gigantic theft. You want the ability to steal the land of society and tell society to fuck off. If you don't agree that I can steal from you, which is clear from your welfare quibs, then you should be consistent and not steal from society. You're advocating for serious inconsistency. Ah, so the state is society, and society owns everything. Uh, and so, now l let me tell you, if I... If I steal from society, say I say I'm not paying taxes anymore, uh, does that mean that my next door neighbor can come and throw me in prison? Or are only some people allowed to do that? Do they have to wear badges first? Or can anybody come and do that? You know, is, is, is everyone's society, the total, totality of the population, do they have the right to act in the same way that somebody who says that they're a police officer can? Because in real life, that's not true. They can't. In real, actual life, you want to pretend in your make-believe land that the state and society is the same thing, then people in society can do anything that the state can do, and vice versa. There's no distinction. I can go up to the Capitol, and I can just go walk into the Capitol, the Dome, and walk around the halls of Congress or the White House as much as I want, because the state and society are the same thing, and I'm part of society, so I'm part of the state. When that's not the case, because I've been to the Capitol and it's fenced off, and there are men with guns in cars sitting around it, and anyone who tries to get past the barricade, they don't make it unless they're in the government. There is a distinction in real life that you are pretending isn't there. Now, there also is this very uh, market ignorance where uh, if I am not contributing to the government, then I am somehow depriving society of of my property. Uh, no. People who own property will still go and commit and do commerce with other people. Voluntary exchange, which is mutually beneficial. So if I have a farm, I'm still going to want to sell my goods and I won't force people to buy them. If they value them, then they'll exchange for them and we'll both be better off. So I'm not depriving society of anything. But when the state comes and says, we're just taking whatever we demand and we're going to use it for whatever we think is necessary, you know, killing people, giving out moral hazardous welfare that encourages people to be poor forever, uh, you know, uh, preventing people from using drugs that are life-saving and, of course, causing thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of deaths when you add it up over the years. Uh, you know, that's depriving society of anything. Um, you know, if you think that society and the state is the same thing, well, why don't you just become, why don't you just start acting like the president? You know, why, why don't you just start acting like a legislature or a cop? Just go around, start writing people tickets, telling them they have to give you money, and if they don't, just start throwing them in prison. And when you get arrested, you can just say, I'm just, we're all the same. There's no distinction between the state and the society at large, and I'm part of the society at large. And so, you know, you shouldn't be doing this because what I'm doing is the same thing you're doing. Like, this is absolute sycophancy at its worst. This is a person who is... Uh, drooling at the jackboot that is stomping on his face or would stomp on his face if he had the uh, intelligence or the or the um, uh, the wherewithal to resist, which he doesn't. Uh, you know, and and it's it's kind of the big myth of democracy that it's society doing it to itself. It's not it's not some elite. You know, Barack Obama is just like everybody else. I've heard other people say, you know, Barack Obama is a slave to the electorate. I'm like, yeah, go and treat Barack Obama like a slave. Whip him and chide him for not doing the right things that you think he should do. And see what see how how far that gets you. You know, try try and run a political party. Just just start your own. It's so easy apparently. You know, why don't you engage in the political process in the manner that you say invalidates my conception of reality? Yeah, okay. Do that and then Come back on here and tell me how you got elected to be governor or congressman or anything, dog catcher in a small town, and, and then we can talk again. But until until you do that, then you have no basis whatsoever for uh, thinking that your description of the world is anything other than a fantasy. So that's it.